go ahead and get started then. Um, welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, excited to see all of you today. Uh, and for those of you guys who are tuning in on Facebook as well, hello to you all. Uh, today, we actually have a great guest. Um, you know, we, I've had the privilege of interviewing her for one of the podcast episodes, the podcast that I run. And now she's going to share some of her knowledge on the residential and real estate space uh, because she has a lot of experience in both. Her name's Christy Yaki. She's actually an agent with our office and been with us for about a year now, which is crazy to think. It's really just flown by. So, I know. Um, yeah, it's exciting to have you here today and uh, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited and I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. So awesome. No, I have a ton and I have a ton and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience and also those watching on Facebook may have some questions as well. So what will essentially happen is we're going to provide, you know, the opportunity. I'm going to ask several questions to you regarding your experiences. And then from there, we'll open it up to Q and a uh, with the audience, both on zoom and Facebook. And yeah, we'll kind of go from there. Wonderful. I'll be here. All right. So first off, uh, I know who you are. I know your background and I know, you know, a lot about you, but maybe some of the people in the audience don't. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, just kind of spiel, uh, go, uh, take it away. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go like fast forward through my background a little bit. So I moved to Louisville. I'm not a local term person, um, but I moved to Louisville, uh, just about five years ago. I started in inside sales for a plastic distributor, and that was the worst thing in the world. And then uh, left that job, went to selling dumpsters for outside sales, um, and that was way more fun than you'd ever believe. And then uh, the micromanagement just became unbearable. So I decided to go to the total other end of the spectrum and quit my corporate job um, and started into residential real estate. So I was on a residential team within Keller Williams and I sold 26 homes in 10 months and then at month you know I mean kind of from month six to ten I just knew it wasn't a forever career for me I'm sure we'll go into that a bit more and so I threw my hat in the ring to be a residential real estate brokerage manager and um, so I actually after nine interviews, got the job of managing the second largest brokerage in Louisville, uh, and I did that for about 10 months as well, um, and it was a lot more than I bargained for, but also with COVID and the cultural changes and never having any HR experience or recruitment experience um, and having to tackle all of those really touchy topics uh, on an everyday basis, it was just something that I realized was not a passion of mine and I didn't want to do it every day anymore. And um, I have been with my high school sweetheart for nine years and he proposed to me last summer. So uh, we had the talk of, look, I've always wanted to go into commercial. I re really feel like I would be good at it, um, but I just financially couldn't do it on my own um, and asked him if he would support me if I needed it. And he, of course, said anything I needed, he would be there for. So. Um, I, like Raphael said, just celebrated my one year anniversary in mid-August, um, and I did way better than I thought I was going to do, uh, and Ian did not need to support me, which he is loving, <laughs> but uh, it, it's had its ups and downs, but it finally feels like I'm on the right path for me, so that's kind of how I got here. <laughs> that's awesome, yeah, and, and having that conversation is often a difficult one. Uh, you know, Ian's Ian, her, her husband is an engineer. I was an engineer before jumping into commercial real estate. So, you know, I, having that conversation with Nat, my now fiance as well uh, was definitely a, a difficult one because he's like, wait, you're going to go from what you were doing before where it's a, a lucrative profession to, you know, essentially eating what you kill, right? right. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a very, uh, it can be a very touchy subject. But again, it's if, if you're really passionate about it, you know, you got to pursue what you're passionate about and you're obviously excellent at what you do. So, Really excited to have you as part of the group. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you is what got you interested in real estate to begin with? I mean, obviously you were doing inside sales. I think you went to university for for sales as well. Is that correct? But uh, what, what, go ahead. Yeah. So I actually went to Illinois State University in the middle of a lot of cornfields um, because I majored in professional sales. So I did a lot of role playing, a lot of negotiation study, a ton of personality type studies. Um, so that's something that I really enjoyed and decided 
actually I was going to be an actuary. I don't know if you know that, Raphael, but uh, I talk way too much to be an actuary. So I decided, all right, sales still has some numbers involved, but it's a lot more people oriented. So that's why I got into sales and how I got into real estate was honestly, I, um, it had nothing to do with real estate. My mentor who trained me at waste management is one of the best sales women I've ever seen in my life. And she sold eight homes in her first month. So uh, I took her to lunch and I was like, I just need help. I don't know what to do with my life. And uh, she said, you know, why don't you come work for us and see what you think? And, you know, all the things that a lot of residential real estate agents think is, oh, the flexibility and I can make my own schedule and my income is limitless. And okay, yeah, these things are kind of true and we'll dive into that, but it sounded a lot better than having scheduled bathroom breaks, which is what I had. Um, so I decided to just jump in and I told myself if I didn't make a paycheck in six months, I'd go back into the corporate world because I am very much a corporate kind of girl, um, but I sold 13 houses. So I was like, well, I guess I'll stick to it. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and that's one thing I wanted to unpack a little bit because you're, you're right. You, you had an uncommon amount of success your first year and you said you sold 26 homes in 10 months. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't sell 26 homes in their first couple of years in the business. So can you tell us a little bit about what strategies you employed to kind of make you so successful just in that first year within the business? Yeah. So something that for me personally, um, that works really well in commercial now, but something in residential that I had to be really cognizant of is that I am a very strong hunter. And so, you know, like you said, you go to, you go for the kill all the time because your income depends on it. So uh, in residential, I was on a team that worked internet leads and I was relentless. So I would come in every day and make about 40 phone calls to strangers that either knew or didn't know that they clicked on an ad um, and flip those leads and then start showing them homes. And um, one of the main things that I would say really helped me in my success was over communicating upfront. That's something that I do with all of my clients, um, no matter what, something I do with my friends too. It's just I need you to know what's going to happen because, hey, I don't want them to be surprised and freak out because I am not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. And that's why I left residential because it's so emotion based. And you know what? We all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. And a weakness is definitely something you can work on, but it's never going to be anything that totally becomes a strength. Like you can work on it and work on it, but your strengths are still going to be your strengths. And so it just started to become really exhausting when I had to just pull on these emotion strings all the time and, you know, write out a whole email or text and say, all right, you're going to do this. And then you need to do this. And then you have to do this. And then this is going to happen. And then I have to delete the whole thing and say, I'm so excited for you. I know your kids are going to love this. Your puppy's so cute, you know, and then go into it. And so in residential, when you're working a book of business and you're trying to build clientele that use you over and over and over, you know, most people buy a home every four years. And so for you to keep dripping on them so often in a way that's not annoying, but also very sincere is, is a true skill that a lot of residential agents have. And that was something where, yes, I can take notes on our past conversations. And yes, I do have a good memory of what we spoke on. Um, but is it going to be the first thing I ask you about all the time? Probably not. And so, you know, you have to know your limits of what you're good at and what you're not. And uh, that was one of those things that I always had to be aware of. But in my world, when I always told them what was going to happen, that's where I earned their trust so quickly because what I said came true. And so when I got the reputation for that and I got the confidence to know what was actually going to happen, you know, it helped the, the process go a lot smoother. 100%. Yeah. Transparency is huge. I mean, I've had conversations with people where not only do you show them the pros, you also say, well, this is actually stuff that's probably not a good idea, you know, right. especially when you're talking, you know, with people, I mean, a lot of times, especially in the residential space, that could be their biggest purchase they ever make. And so kind of being that trusted advisor and being able to advise them and say, look, these are the pros and cons of this particular location and blah, 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 like really goes a long way towards you gaining their trust. So yeah. that's awesome. So you kind of highlighted a little bit as to why you made the leap, but why did you decide? Because again, you, you've had, you had a lot of success in the residential space. If you kept along with it and kept doing what you were doing, who knows, you know, if you, you could have sold, you know, 50 homes the next year. I mean, what made you decide to make the leap to commercial? Uh, for me, it was what I was passionate about. You know, it's not interior design. It's not if people have a mudroom. 
you know, it's just, I came from a, a, you know, rather hard life. And so I wasn't raised with a lot. And when you start to get in these conversations, you know, the longer you're in real estate, ideally, the higher up in income levels you start to work. And I think in the beginning, a lot of residential agents think, oh my gosh, I just want to help clients that want half a million dollar houses. Like that's the dream. And they're like, how do I get there? You know, and when you work and you work and you work, and then you finally start to help those clients. And I did start to help those clients. And the conversations totally changed. And I didn't like those conversations either. You know, when I had, I was at a showing of a million dollar home and they said, what kind of concrete ceiling is this floor? And I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, well, you need to find out, you know, and it's like, that does not matter, you know, in my world. And to some residential agents, that's a big deal to them. You know, they care about that kind of stuff. Finishes are huge. You know, what interior designer you use is huge. And I just started to see that there was no space in residential where I would feel really fulfilled because it was all going to be a little bit annoying in my world. You know, I, I will say that a lot of very successful real estate agents and a majority of real estate agents are either healthcare workers or teachers, stay at home moms um, or nurses that get out of their fields. And when you start to see the patterns of these are all caretaking roles um, and they love handholding and they love the reward of, you know, someone having their dreams come true. Like, yeah, I like that too, but I myself like to look at the numbers and I like to have very logical conversations. Whereas, um, you know, when, when you show so many houses and then they start to drive away from them and don't even look at them because they don't like the landscaping or they don't like the carpet or the paint color bothers them. You know, in my world and in the commercial world, everything is negotiable. We can ask for it. You can change it. You can give less in price to make it happen. You can ask for a credit, you know, but in residential, there's so many people that don't have the capacity or don't want to just deal with it, that they'll just move on. And a lot of residential agents that, you know, have a harder time standing up for their boundaries get walked all over every single day because they just try and make people happy. And at the end of the day, um, I demand respect before I demand being liked by people. And so that's where I had a strength to say, no, you're not pre-approved. I'm not going to show you that house, you know, because I know at the end of the day, the only person's time who I'm, who's being wasted is mine. And I really like to have my plans actually go through today, you know? And so when you have all that, you know, coupled with the fact that, yeah, your schedule is flexible, but what that really means when you start out in residential real estate is instead of working an eight to five, you now work more of a 11 to eight, you know, and your schedule based on what your appointments are, are doing. But I can't tell you how many times I made a dinner and then wasn't able to eat it because I had to go and show a house last minute. So that's something that is really challenging too that a lot of people don't think about. Definitely. No, for sure. And, and, and again, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it's two different people you're serving, right? There's you're serving in a residential setting, you're serving someone who's looking to buy a home to have their family and everything else. Whereas in the commercial side, you're typically dealing with business owners and investors and the, their, their needs and desires are going to be completely different than someone who's just going to be occupying the space to live in. And, and rightfully so, if you're going to be living in a space that you want to feel comfortable, you want to feel like, you know, it's a good fit for you and your family, in particular, if you're going to stay there for a long period of time, whereas in the, in, in the business setting, I mean, again, it's very numbers based. It's like, okay, what, what is, what are the traffic counts of this area? You know, what are the demographics? You know, what, you know, what, what are some of the comparable sales of the last, you know, over in this area? So, you know, it's, it's a little bit different in a, of an approach. And so I think, you know, kind of what you said, it's, it's depending on what your personality type is. Like if you like that sort of thing, which I really like, I mean, that's, I came from an engineering background. That's kind of my thing. And I've always been kind of entrepreneurial. So, you know, that really lends itself to my skill set. Uh, then you're a good fit in commercial. Otherwise, you may, you may be a great fit in residential. And there's a lot of residential agents that do a phenomenal job and you know, they make a lot of money doing it. So so one thing I wanted to kind of share with you is, uh, or ask about of you is what are some of the struggles in the transition? Because that's one of the things I've talked to 
a good amount of residential agents. You know, they, they reach out to me. They're asking advice about doing commercial deals and potentially making the transition, but I've never had to make the transition. I jumped straight into commercial. And so it's like my, my mindset or my view is very linear because that's, I've, that's all I've ever done. So could you kind of tell us a little bit about some of the, you know, struggles you faced from oh, yeah. when you started to, you know, today? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, I think there was so many things that people told me and I was like, yeah, I get it. And then when you actually are living through it, you're like, wow, this sucks, you know? And like in residential, you know, most people will say if you're an individual agent and you, you know, you're, you should expect your first paycheck in about six months because it's, it's a quicker turnaround time. Most people, when they say they want to buy a house, they'll buy a, they'll put an offer in and it's going to close in 30 to 45 days. Uh, in the commercial world, it's going to be probably six to nine months. And if it's rezoning, like you could just sign it off for next year, pretty much. Um, so that was something where in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I get it. The transactions will take longer. But like when you're living on a transaction and it's month seven and you still don't know if it's going to close or not, that is incredibly stressful. And I thought, you know, residential agents, we're a little bit dramatic and you're trying to rein everyone in to get this deal working. Well, it's the opposite in commercial. It's a hurting cat. And it's like, can we care? Can we all get on the same page? Does anyone have an update? Does anyone know what's going on? And so now you've changed your role to being like the headmaster that's like keeping everyone in their place. Whereas in residential, you kind of like check down the boxes and it all just kind of goes through. Yeah, things go wrong. And I totally get that. Um, but they do in commercial too. I mean, I myself have, have quite a few stories in commercial. Um, so I think another thing was, you know, it's going to take you longer to close, to close a transaction. And um, yeah, I, I know that I just talked about it, but, but when I got in having my, you know, two years in residential real estate experience, it still took me seven months to make any money, like any, like one, one dime. And that check was $2,500 that I was like, wow, okay, cool. And then I didn't make another paycheck for two and a half months. So I went three fourths of a year on $2,500. So, you know, that's something where a lot of residential agents and my friends, you know, too, come to me and they're like, oh my gosh, you're commercial now, you make the big bucks. And it's like, kind of, I mean, eventually I'll get there, but it takes like up to year four and five to really have an income and a reputation to earn those higher listings and those higher buyers. Um, because in the beginning, a lot of times you're helping startups and startups have no idea what's going on and they really don't understand and truthfully it's sad um, how hard it is for them to actually put their business into a building because landlords don't wanna take a risk. you know. And so you're fighting for someone whose dream you really believe in, but it has nothing to do with you. It depends all on the landlords. and so. You're trying to be a cheerleader while also having to be extremely realistic all of the time. Um, in residential, you have a lot more hope. You know, there'll be another house. You know, we'll find one with the right backyard. You know, and it's the odds are probably good because how many houses hit every single week? In commercial, I've been helping one client for three months, and I've had one new listing pop up that fits all their boxes, and it's three hundred thousand dollars over their budget. So it's like you know, I'm sorry, can we look at, you know, this other one and see if we can renovate it into what you want? Because there's just so few and far between um, that a lot of times it's hard to find what businesses want and they do have to pay to make it what they are looking for. Um, so that's a conversation you have to have as well, that everything is negotiable, which is kind of fun, but it took me a good six months to unlearn residential and learn commercial because you know, the hardest part of residential, and I can say it because I did it, the hardest part is repair requests. And that's non-existent in commercial. So when I came in feeling all prepared, like I have experience, I'm good to go. And then, you know, it's like, oh, that's not a thing here. Don't worry about it. You know, and then it's like, well, then what do I need to be good at? And so you have to like totally backtrack. And a lot of it's just having the conversations of knowing the areas of town, knowing specific businesses that will be successful in specific areas and being able to analyze that and really understanding 
the city that you work in because in residential, they usually tell you what they want. But in commercial, a lot of times they're from out of state and you have to tell them what's good for them and then if it's within their budget or not. So that was something that, you know, really took me some time to, to have the confidence to have those conversations of, hey, if you're a boutique and you're surrounded by all of these restaurants and these restaurants are only open when you're closed, probably not going to help you, you know, and, um, and that's just not a thing in residential. And that's just a, from me having my shopping experience, but also B, you know, being able to understand the area and know what's good and not good for them individually. And you have to do that with every single client you work with. 100%. Yeah. And, and what's what I really love about commercial is that I get to learn so much about so many different types of businesses. Mm -hmm. And then you could, you could advise them because you're exactly right. I've had to have tough conversations with people, especially startups, because a lot of times it's they're going off of a dream and, and this this idea that they're, uh, you know, they can create something magical for themselves. But in reality, they a lot of times they don't put in the legwork on the front end. And yeah. a lot of times you're kind of having to tell them about their own business, which is not a good idea because really, you know, 50 percent of businesses fail. So if you're not doing the legwork on your end and I'm having to tell you stuff that, that is pertaining to your business, you're going to be in trouble. And then you, you almost want to keep them from making the commitment of getting a space because now it's like, that could be a financial burden they have to deal with over the yeah. next several years. And so, you know, screening clients, especially when you first start out with, with startups is, is something that I had to learn with. I mean, I had a client I was working with for two years and we couldn't get her in a space, you know, and a big part of that was because the, of the legwork she was unwilling to put in. And I think after a while I realized that, okay, this is not a fruitful endeavor anymore. So that sort of thing happens on a regular basis. And like you said, the transaction cycle is, is a real thing. You know, I, my first deal, I think was like three months in, it was a small office lease. I think I made like 900 bucks. And then after that, it was like nothing for another three months. And I just kept that kept going. And, you know, I, I really didn't even eclipse. I had a draw for the first year and I didn't even eclipse it until after my first year. So it's one of those things where, you know, commercial is definitely a, a slow process. And there's a lot of people that just get very frustrated early on because they're not seeing results immediately and they're putting in a ton of effort and they're not seeing it. And so they, they kind of fall, fall on by the wayside. But if you last that four, five, six, seven years and you put in the work, I mean, that's really where you start seeing the significant results. So. Yeah. And I would say, you know, touching on that, not to jump topics, but something mm -hmm. that was another really big difference and challenge for me was, you know, my number one strength, if you've ever taken strength finders, I highly suggest it, but my number one strength is uh, strategy. And so when I got into commercial, I thought, this is my game plan. This is who I'm going to target. This is how I'm going to market myself on and on and on. And that didn't work or that didn't get my restrictions much response or that took way too long and didn't get me anything, you know, and I had to just keep changing and changing and shifting and changing to the point where I thought I could come in and just go back into corporate mode and go door knocking and smile at people and, you know, set random appointments and show up and make everybody happy. And that's how I would get business because that's what I used to be really good at. And door knocking is dead. It's dead. I mean, before COVID, people were already letting go of their you know, front office admins and secretaries to an automated system. And now when you walk in a manufacturing plant, you just see a phone and it has a bunch of uh, extension numbers. And a lot of them don't even have the names by the extension number. You just have to know. So that was hard when that was like my really big hope of getting in front of business owners. And it's like non-existent now. And so that was something I had to just cut out of of something I put a lot of weight on, you know, which I still am bummed about it because I love being in front of people. But when you door knock for four hours and you only got to actually talk to three people and none of them either know the decision maker and they're definitely not the decision maker, you know, it's like that got me absolutely nowhere. And that was a huge waste of time. Um, the other thing is, you know, cold calling. And residential, you know, cold calling is super common, especially if you're working internet leads. Every call is a cold call. Um, but in commercial, you can only call X amount of business owners so many times before you either tick them off or you ruin your reputation for being too annoying. And so that's a really fine line that you have to watch that I had never had to watch before um, because you have to build a book and the book can only be so big when you do commercial. Um, so that was something that, you know, taught me a lot. I would say, you know, something that residential agents don't really do that we have to do is 
getting in front of as many people as humanly possible. Like, I don't care what you do for a living. I just need you to know that I'm a commercial real estate agent and hopefully the seeds will be sown and they'll grow. But in residential, you know, you can wear your name tag around the grocery store. You can like name drop yourself all the time. And I never did that. I don't like doing that. But there's a lot of agents that are super successful, but I also didn't like being a residential real estate agent. So I wasn't exactly like, you know what I do for a living? You know, because you want to be proud of what you do. And so that's where I've had to change and be a lot more intentional about going to almost every single networking event I'm possibly invited to um, because that's how I earn my income. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, and again, there's, there's, there's typically a lot less commercial agents than residential ones. So if you can be a top of mind person, because I mean, outside of our industry, like if I ask someone, do you know a commercial real estate agent? Most of them are like, no, I don't, I, right. I don't think I've ever met anyone. So that's the one thing. If you get out in front of a lot of people and doing stuff like this, where you, you know, you do your, your, the meetups or, you know, podcast interviews, getting to meet the, to networking events. That's, that's how you do it. You just become that top of mind person. And over time people remember like, oh yeah, Krista, she's a commercial agent, you know, let me put you in contact with her. And that's how a lot of the, the relationships are sown. So that's awesome. So what are some of the top lessons, you know, kind of, and we kind of touched on some of them, but now that you're a year in, you know, you, you've already kind of built some momentum. What, what do you think are some of the top lessons that you've learned that you would compart to someone um, that's kind of looking to make a similar jump? Um, I would say that in residential, it's based a ton off of your personality. How do you differentiate yourself? Because there are so many and a lot of the future is social media, you know, and a lot of residential agents are turning to that and it's working extremely well for them. Um, and commercial, luckily, you know, there's not many people our age that are the target market for commercial real estate. And so social media, yes, it works. And yes, it's a, a way to get your name out there. Um, but does it have to be your number one priority? No. And so I found like Raphael does, you know, a ton of YouTube and training and I love it and he loves it. And my angle is getting in front of people. And so I go to a lot of events. And so you want to find what your specific niche is, because once you select something, you need to be really good at it. Um, whereas in residential, a lot of people are just like, I'm a residential agent and you're trusted, you know, but in commercial, it's a lot about your reputation. Who do you work with? How long have you done it? What are you good at? What do you specialize in? And if you don't choose to specialize in something, I specialize in industrial. If you don't choose to specialize in something, you can't just be a jack of all trades because that almost hurts you sometimes, um, you know, and it loses credibility. So that was a lesson that, you know, you need to select a topic and just really study it and, and dedicate yourself to it. And another thing was, you know, I think coming from residential where it's so fun and everything's so celebrated and everything's a big event, you know, to commercial where, you know, you might not even get to meet your clients ever, period. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to feel like I'm dramatic sometimes when in the residential world, I was one of the most boring people, you know, but now that I'm on this side, I choose to not let my bubbliness fade because it helps differentiate me. So that's a cognizant decision that I've made. Yes, there are some, you know, people that look at me and think I'm too silly or not smart enough or whatever because of how I act. But there's also a lot of people that feel intimidated by commercial real estate agents because they are rather tough and unwelcoming sometimes. And so I get to have a lot more conversations with people that just want to talk, you know, and I'm all about talking. And, and seeing where it could go. And so that's helped me personally a lot with my business to just be an open door that people can feel like they can come to. That's awesome. Yeah. There, uh, John Lee Dumas runs a very famous podcast and he always says, your vibe will find your tribe. So really what vibe you put out in the universe is, is really what people are going to be attracted to that, or maybe they'll be repelled by that. I, I'm, I'm confident there's people out there that would not want to work with me just because of my, you know, how, how I operate, just my vibe. And that's okay. But those are probably the people that, that I wouldn't be a good fit for anyways, because I wouldn't be able to serve them as best as I can. Whereas there's probably other people that would love to work with me because I have a, we have very similar personality, maybe sense of humor, maybe we have similar backgrounds, et cetera. Therefore, you know, we, we naturally mesh together and we can, you know, we can, we can do business in, in, a, in a great way. 
Uh, so yeah, I a hundred percent agree with you on that front. And then as far as like the jump process, one thing that I'd love you to kind of elaborate on is that, you know, with residential real estate, like if you get a residential license, you can go to most brokerages and just hang your license. Like that's, that's very common. You know, a lot of them are trying to recruit you to come into the, the fold. Whereas with commercial, it's, it's hard. It's not, it's hard to break in. I mean, I, I came from an engineering background. I had no connections within the commercial space. And a lot of times it's just relationships. Like you have to meet people, you have to sit down with people, you have to, you know, tell them what you're interested in. And you may have to do that a lot, long time before you actually get an opportunity with a brokerage. Mm -hmm. So could you kind of talk a little bit about maybe that process and what oh, made yeah. you? Oh yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting how much of a divide there is. And now that I'm on the commercial side, I understand, rightfully so. Commercial is very complicated. And if you don't study it, yes, there are residential agents that dabble in multifamily and dabble in office a little bit, you know, but when it comes to refitting a retail space, I mean, Raphael, would you ever allow a residential agent to do that? You know? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it can be dicey, especially if you're talking about something that needs to be negotiated with the landlord, like, you know, concessions, et cetera. So you have to really understand what you're looking at as far as leases are concerned and then the purchase agreements as well. I mean, especially like you were talking about zoning issues or environmental issues, a lot of things you don't really come across when you're dealing with residential real estate. It can be pretty dicey. So, oh, yeah, I mean, 100 percent. So now that I know how much goes into certain aspects of it, you know, I would say you need to be with a brokerage that knows how to answer your questions. And a lot of times the more complicated and deals that you get, the only way anyone's gonna be able to help you is if it's a commercial brokerage. Um, you know, I think, yes, there are agents, commercial agents that hang their license at residential brokerages and they get a lot of referrals that way. But a lot of times if you actually interview them, they're the agents that have already built a big enough book that they don't need to actually go out and look for business. And they have their clients that they know they're going to have. And so they, it's like an icing on top to go to a residential brokerage to get those extra referrals if they even want them. Um, you know, a lot of times residential uh, brokerages will have um, lower brokerage fees. And so that's something to consider too when you ask around is, you know, what is the commission split going to look like? But for me, I wanted to be really good at what I do. And I wanted to work with people who really knew what they were doing that could help me. And, and Raphael has seen some of the crazy situations I've been put in that even, even my broker has done it for years. was like, how did this happen? You know? And so to be at a brokerage that doesn't specialize can be really tricky. Um, but honestly, it, uh, most brokerages don't allow you to do both um, because state law has different requirements for residential versus commercial brokerages. And it's extra liability, it's an extra escrow account. And so there's different things that go into it on the back end that brokerages don't, don't want to put the effort into. And so, you know, you might be on the fence thinking, yeah, I might do commercial, but you might not even be allowed to at your office. So that's something that you would want to check. Um, and then, you know, just some other things. I mean, I've interviewed with brokerages that looked at me and said, you know, we really don't want anyone under 35. I've looked at brokerages and said, you know what, we don't do industrial. You know, and so, so you have to figure out which, which avenue you want to take in life before you start interviewing, and then you can get comfortable and saying, this is what I want, and I'll wait until I find it, because there will be a brokerage out there. There's so many brokerages. Um, I mean, we're in a city, and I understand some places are smaller, but, um, but you have to know what you want and go and find it, and you have to ask the right questions um, to set some boundaries for yourself so that you know what you're getting into, because a lot of times, you know, some of the really big national brokerages, well, you don't do your own paperwork and you don't do your own marketing and you don't do on and on and on and on, which at first you would think, oh, that's awesome. That's a lot off my shoulders. But then when you look into it, it's, well, you're not allowed to brand yourself and you're not allowed to, you know, market yourself and you're not allowed to say certain things, you know, and if you get a lead, you have to send it to so-and-so because it doesn't really belong to you. And so the deeper you get into those type of situations, you start to understand, you know, what do, what do I need? What do I want? Do I just want to work leads? Because yeah, that might be you, but I am a control freak. And so I want to be in charge of all of it. And I want to know all the moving parts at the same time. And there's a lot of brokerages where you're not allowed to do that. And so that's something to consider as well. Yeah, I know. And and I, I did a video of this a while back with the differences between 
boutique brokerages and big brokerages where, you mm -hmm. know, with the bigger brokerages, like you said, you're, you're kind of just, you know, the transaction, you're, you're running the transaction. You don't have to worry about marketing, et cetera. Usually the splits are, are a lot more high. So you're not, you're not taking home as much. And there's a team structure where you're kind of focused on one area. You know, you're, you're only doing industrial deals or you're only doing retail or you're only doing office. So it's very difficult as far as like branching out from those, those avenues. And particularly if you don't know what you want to do, you know, especially right. when you first get in, you don't really know if you want to do industrial or want to do retail or what want to do whatever. Like when I first joined, I, I, I had no idea. And now I'm starting to gravitate a little more towards retail because I really enjoy it. And industrial is very interesting as well. But, you know, if I was on a team that only did office, like I'm kind of, you know, I saw off on that front. Whereas with boutique brokerages, you know, you, you have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to, you know, your personal branding, which in my opinion is the most important thing for mm -hmm. any business professional is to your brand is going to be king going forward, whether that's, you know, doing, um, you know, YouTube or social media, or even branding yourself when you go to events or running events, et cetera. So I think that's, that's critical and crucial. Um, so yeah, I think you, you, you kind of hit, hit the nail on the head. So really what it comes down to is just reaching out to people and sitting down with people and trying to get in front of as many people with different brokerages as you can to see if it's a good cultural fit. And then from there, you know, just, just keep following up because that's, yeah. that's the name of the game. Oh yeah. That's awesome. So what I'll go ahead and do is I wanted to ask you one last question before we open it up to Q&A. Uh, and that is, do, would you have any recommendations as far as resources that you would recommend people refer to if they're looking to potentially make a jump from residential to commercial? Yeah. So when I got into it, um, I actually bought the book, Don't Judge Me, uh, Commercial Real Estate Investing for Dummies. And it blew my mind. Like it taught me so much um, and it was an easy read, you know, they're written for dummies. Uh, so it was, it was a really good resource to just give me the basics and some of it at the time I didn't understand. Um, but, you know, I understand a lot more now, but it at least helped me understand the beginning of it. I also, um, when I first started about twice a month, I would set a meeting with an investor in town and I would just pick their brain. I'd take them to lunch, I'd take them to coffee, and I'd say, what do you look for in properties? What's a good tenant mean to you? You know, what are you willing and not willing to do for the right person? And so that got me some insight into how they think um, so that I can think a little bit more like them. Even though financially I'm not there yet, I'm able to process the same, a similar way that they do. So that helped me a lot. Um, I also, Something that residential could relate to too, and also helped me with commercial was I interviewed, not for a job, but I interviewed a, a hard money lender to see how that process worked and what did that look like and how, what's a good candidate to even get that in the first place. Um, and then honestly, I've let a lot of people take me to lunch. Residential agents that wanted to ask me questions, um, lenders that wanted a new contact because when you have to answer residential agents' questions, you have to get a lot faster and better at knowing the answers before they ask them. Um, and so that made me study a bit harder. And then um, talking to lenders and seeing what different options there were, especially when I started helping startups and I just felt so hopeless, you know, and I really just dug down and was like, what, what can I actually help these people with? You know, what options do they have? What advice can I give them? Because that's going to be a lot of the conversations in the beginning is startups. And so being a, a gentle navigator to not kill their dream, but also be realistic is, is something that you're going to have to master. Um, but other than that, I, I just interviewed a lot of commercial real estate agents and I asked them, you know, when was the first year that you made $100,000? You know, what do you like and not like about certain sectors? Um, you know, and the, and those kind of things. It's just, you have to come from curiosity every single day and something that I knew I would have to do, but now I just do it on, on a much higher level is I study the economy every day. So I start out looking at, you know, articles about what's going on in the world. Um, right now I have subscriptions to Wall Street Journal's uh, economics everyday update and logistics everyday update because um, industrial has a lot of uh, logistics, you know, relations. Um, so other than that, that's something that as a woman, you know, I have to study and work really hard to be in this industry. And so that's something that helped gain my confidence because I, 
you know, did my due diligence, but also when I can talk about these things with a lot of businessmen, you know, it helps uh, my credibility with them as well. And I can, you know, have my seat at the table. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and I, I really think that it's valuable what you said about, you know, building those connections with, you know, the, 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 the parts of the process, right? Lenders, lawyers, all these other people, not only do you learn about the process more effectively, but you can more effectively guide your clients to where they need to be. So for example, mm -hmm. there's some banks out there that don't do retail. So you wouldn't know that unless you talk to the lender and said, Hey, what do you guys, what's your appetite for this type of property or what's your appetite for this type of use? And so you start talking to all these different lenders and you start getting an idea. Oh, these guys are good for ground up construction. These guys are good for industrial properties. These guys are good for multifamily. And you start getting an idea so you can more effectively quarterback the deal. And then obviously through the, your relationship with, with the brokerage, you know, Paul's kind of someone who's our broker. He knows like everyone in town. So you're like, Hey, can I get a zoning lawyer? Can I talk to a zoning lawyer? He's like, Oh, here, here's three, three people yeah. you can talk to. So that, that type of thing is like utilize the, the, your broker, who's been in the business for quite some time. And particularly if you, you should join a brokerage that's high performing, in which case, you know, they should have connections with everyone. So if, in that case, talk to those people, establish relationships and really get an understanding of what you're, what you're going to be doing so you can better advise your clients. So it's awesome advice, really. Okay. So, so what we're going to go ahead and do now is we're going to open up the Q and A. I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to kind of ask any questions they may have regarding, you know, Krista's experience or any other questions you had pertaining to either residential or commercial or the transition between the two. So feel free to ask away. All right. So we have one question from Cassandra. So, Hey, Cassandra, uh, how does, Hi, how, yeah, there you go. <laughs> So how do you find a good commercial real estate agent? I guess more so, how do you, how do you determine if a good if a commercial real estate agent is, is a good one? Well, um, I'll answer both ways, just in case Cassandra has a friend that, you know, just wants to find a commercial agent. Um, the most basic answer to that is to look up CCIM memberships and see if they have their designation. CCIM is the MBA, uh, I don't know, certificate that you earn um, to be in the commercial realm. Um, however, that's usually, um, you know, really experienced agents that only want a certain kind of business. And so, you know, they might not be the most welcoming to all, all kinds of leads. Um, I would suggest looking up offices, you know, seeing their reviews, seeing what they specialize in. Um, and then a lot of times reading their bios and seeing, you know, who you might fit in best with, who you would like to work with, um, I've had random people call our office and they choose my extension because I'm a woman and quote, my name sounded like I was nice, you know? And so it's like, people will, will just do whatever they want. And so a lot of times you just, you know, come from kindness and market yourself. Yes. But a lot of times if people are just looking up how to find a commercial real estate agent, I would suggest LinkedIn, you know, just to double check their history, see what they've been in, how long they've been in it, what their experience is. Um, but then just have a conversation with them. I mean, Raphael and I have conversations every single day that turn into nothing. And so it's, it's no harm on us. It's something that we anticipate on a daily basis. And so if you ever just want to introduce yourself to someone and see if you click, then just give them a call, you know, see if, see if they're nice, see if you like them. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and I, I agree with you hundred percent. I mean, and, and personality types really going to dictate whether or not it's a good fit for you. Uh, Cause again, I'm, I'm probably not going to be everyone's cup of tea. You may not be everyone's cup of tea. Uh, so that's really the first starting point. And then from there, I, I would say, you know, if what they specialize in is something also that, that kind of could help as well. Like, cause again, I mean, like Krista said, like she probably knows more to be honest with you. She knows probably knows more about industrial than I do, to be quite honest with you. I've, I've never, done an industrial deal. I, I'm actually working on my first industrial deal now, and we're potentially going to close a lease deal with industrial real estate, but I've never really done a lot in industrial. So she probably knows way more than me about industrial. Now I, I've done a lot in the retail side and I probably mm -hmm. know a lot about a retail, you know, but that's just through the experience that I've had. So, you know, maybe asking them about their background and what they've done is, 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 of, is of help. And then just kind of explain, you know, walk me through a time you did this or walk me through a time you did yeah. that. So. And uh, Cassandra, I was going to say, if you're an agent, I would look them up on the, uh, you know, the MLS system and see what their previous sales histories were, if there was a pattern, so that it looks like if they specialize in something or not, um, and that that kind of thing. But still, just really just calling them, honestly. <laughs> Amazingly, if they call you back, they're already ahead of the crowd. 
So <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. So, I mean, and that's unfortunately a reputation that's been that's been developed over time. But it, commercial agents are notorious for not returning calls. Texts, it's a very real stereotype. It's crazy. E- emails. Guys, get them after three o'clock. You're done. Mm-mm, nobody's talking to you. Yeah, no. on the golf course, right? Just kind of. <laughs> well, not, no not always. Not always. Just that that that's a that's a bad stereotype. Not everyone's like that, but. All right. Anyone? Let's see. I'll check Facebook as well. Anyone on Facebook have any questions? Hey, Krista, this is Jake. You talk about just the importance of knowing businesses, especially early on working with startups, and you almost need to know them more sometimes more about it than they do. What communities or, or networks have you found to, to help you get out there in Louisville and, and learn the city, um, where you can find those businesses, and maybe not necessarily people looking for spaces directly? Yeah, yeah, good question. So um, something that I have changed, like I talked about how I've had to shift my strategy. So in the beginning, it was all business owners. I need business owners. And I think so many people have that goal that business owners understand that. And now they've broken their groups up into all these little tiny different meetings. And so I myself am the president of a networking club. I've also uh, visited almost every single BNI in town. And so just to like get my name out there, Um, but from changing from business owners, something that I have um, shifted my focus to because I have the reputation for it is residential real estate agents. So now I actually drip and target on residential real estate agents because I'm happy to do referrals and have those conversations if they would choose not to work the lead themselves. Um, And I've gained a lot of business that way um, because I have the credibility from doing it. But also, as far as business owners do go, you know, there's Chamber of Commerces, but honestly, something that I have started to do, and Raphael's done it too, because we've gone to events together, is uh, Louisville Business First, the local business newspaper, hosts a ton of events. And so, I mean, sometimes it's hard, you know, I just bought a $90 ticket to a breakfast, you know, and I'm like, it's a breakfast, you know, but if I know I pay that much for it, you better believe I'm going to to every single person that I could possibly bump into. Um, and me specifically, being a woman, I go to a lot of women's events um, because I have that angle that I can work and I love to work. Um, so there, there is a lot more women's only events that I attend as well. Yeah, embrace, embrace what makes you different. You know, if, if any advice I could provide to someone is always try to embrace what makes you different and own it. And then, like I said, like we said earlier, your vibe will find your tribe. You know, you'll natu- people will naturally be attracted to you or repelled away from you. And that's fine. It's not a problem. Just be, being okay with that is, I think, half the battle. So that's awesome. Yeah. All right. I would say something that has been really refreshing. Both people have told me and also I feel it that it's refreshing is just being vulnerable sometimes and just saying, you know what, I really feel like I word vomited on you there. And I'm sorry about that, you know, and, you know, leaving a, an appointment and saying, you really screwed that up. Like you did not do a call to action at the end. And now we're all in limbo, you know, and having a real talk with yourself and of how you can grow, I think is always going to keep you ahead because so many commercial real estate agents just get into this realm of, I know what I'm doing. I'm comfortable. I don't need to be better. I make the income I like, you know, and they just stay stagnant and yeah, they might like hook in some really good repetitive leads, but as far as, you know, earning a reputation for helping people and, and um, having more people reach out to them, you know, it's, it's next to non-existent unless it's done on the golf course. And so, uh, you know, that's what they do. I don't do that. And so you have to figure out what you're good at that you would like to focus on. All right. Awesome. So another question for Cassandra. So, hey, Cassandra. So she says, I know someone who is interested in investing in a mixed juice property. How can I best direct this potential investor? Well, I think that's a a great opportunity. I would say the first question is when they say mixed juice, what does that mean? Does that mean apartments and retail? Does that mean office and warehouse? Um, You know, does that mean vacant land that they want to land lease out? So there's definitely different definitions of, of what, direction that could go. Um, And then you could always just refer them to a broker. Um, And a lot of times the broker will siphon out the lead to whatever agents would be good and specialize in that sector. Um, And, or you can just direct them to an agent 
and see if the agent would like to work that lead um, or if they would suggest you give it to somebody else if that's not their specialty. Sure. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, like, like she was saying, the, depending on what the use is, it's going to dictate, you know, what lenders are going to lend on it. It's going to dictate, you know, some of the hurdles you may face, you know, if it's a, a property that may have environmental issues, there's things you got to take into consideration. And so, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a lot to, to go that goes into it. So if without like a significant amount of information, it's kind of hard to. Well, and, you know. and another big difference you know, not that we need to back up so much, but another big difference between residential and commercial is in residential, if you're not pre-approved, I'm not doing anything for you. But in commercial, pre-approval is like the last step. <laughs> so you have to do all the work up front and know that nothing might come of it, you know, and just have that understanding. But you're not showing up, you know, five houses every week. You're showing a property maybe once a month. And so it just looks a little different, but that's something that there's no pre-qualification to push three people through. Yeah, no. And what I what I usually do in that those instances is I try to encourage my client to provide personal financial statements to banks ahead of time. So like, you know, before we start going down this rabbit hole, let's try to see if you can we can I give you three lenders get a personal financial statement, and I have a template that I send them and then they just send it to the bank and you know, at least you get the process started because you're right, they're not going to approve a loan without having a property like to analyze with yeah. commercial it's very much a, a holistic package they want to look at the entire property loan etc and get that all squared away before they issue any type of loan so you're right yeah awesome. everyone to, to both of you Rafi, i know we're both data guys as far as managing your pipelines krista was there a, a noticeable difference in, in how you manage that pipeline you talk about obviously the follow-up is different and the frequency there as far as you're actually managing your leads, managing that data, is there any main differences that you, you realize coming over from residential? Uh, honestly, I suck at it. Um, I'm good at it, but I don't have a software anymore like I used to, to give me reminders. And so um, a lot of times, like we all know, either leads are really hot or they're like next to non-existent. And so once you set them up on a search, they're gonna get email notifications anyway, um, but, you know, I usually call my leads once a month to check on them if I haven't heard from them. But I also email a newsletter totally unrelated to anything specifically they're looking for as part of my marketing package, um, just to stay in their email somehow. Um, and I always, you know, if I call and leave a voicemail, I will text, but a lot of times it's just dripping on them. And then if I haven't heard anything and there's also been no listings come up, then I'll just say, hey, I've been thinking about you, you know, has anything changed based on what you're looking for? Just let me know, you know, and I'll just shoot them a nice text because, you know, there, there's nothing to talk about unless you want to have really in-depth what's going on in your industry, you know, kind of conversation, but those can get really bogged down and, you know, you want to have profitable time instead of just gaining information that might not pay you back. Great, great insights. Awesome. All right, so any other questions? Okay, I think you may have answered all the questions, Krista. Great job. Um, so, Thanks. yeah, so first off, I just want to thank you so much for stopping by. It really means a lot. And I know that uh, the people that are watching this both on Facebook and here in Zoom, and then eventually, if you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, uh, hopefully you gain some value from it as well. Uh, if you want to get in contact with you, learn a little bit more about you, you know, how can they do that? Well, my email is Krista at GrisantiGroup.com, Krista with a K, um, or you can, you know, feel free to call our office and it'll come to my cell phone. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm always, you know, welcome to talk if you guys have any questions and I'm pretty approachable, except like after seven, I usually, now that I'm in commercial, I have set that boundary for myself. So, <laughs> um, so I have peaceful dinners again, and it's nice. but, uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out anytime. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and if you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, watching this on YouTube, we'll be including that in the description below. So you guys can check that out. And yeah. So thank you again so much, everyone for stopping by. We really appreciate you stopping and, and taking some time out of your day to listen to us and uh, we'll see you all next time. Bye. See you Have all. See ya.